Um, so I want to speak today about uh, the European crisis and recovery and focus a little bit on the particular role of the financial sector in Europe in, as I, as I say in the title here, the missing financial recovery in Europe. Um, to just give you a few brief illustrations of European financial crisis vis-a-vis -vis other parts of the world, what's, uh, what's noticeable is that while the recovery in, in the Eurozone was not as severe as Japan, it was more severe than the United States. And what is particularly striking is how slow the Eurozone's recovery is. So you can see that the US, the UK, Japan have all reached levels of GDP above the pre-crisis levels, whereas the Eurozone is still below. The other thing that is very noticeable here is, is the so-called double dip recession, where you see the very, very sharp dip in 2009. And then as, as Europe begins to recover about 2011, 2012, there's a downturn, a second downturn, which is not experienced by and large by the other countries. Japan has a bit of a double dip there as well. Uh, actually, maybe more like a triple dip, but, uh, but at a higher level. Uh, so interesting that the European crisis was both deeper than the source of the crisis, which was the US, and also has taken much longer for recovery to occur. This has been exacerbated by persistent problems in the banking sector. And I'll show s several slides later on that illustrate in, in greater detail. But just to illustrate the point here, this is uh, a measure of book-to-value ratio for US banks versus Euro area banks. And what you can see there is that in terms of valuations, Euro area banks have not recovered their pre-crisis valuations, whereas US banks have in fact exceeded those pre-crisis valuations. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is later on in the presentation. Public sector and private sector debt have also played a role here. Um, you can see from the, the white diamonds there, the pre-crisis debt to GDP ratios in different European countries. And then the sort of 2014 peak levels, which in many cases, in fact, is the peak as a share of GDP. And you can see a considerable rise in some countries, but not so much in others. And this, this is something else that we'll come back to in a few minutes. There were, however, questions about the solvency of some European uh, countries, as reflected by the, the group of stressed countries, which shows a very sharp increase in sovereign yields, and followed by when clear action from the European Central Bank was announced a compression of those yields down to relatively low spreads and low interest rates for both stressed and non-stressed countries now. Lending rates, this is non-financial corporate lending rates, also diverged between core countries and stressed countries. So what you can see is that there is a, a, a much wider dispersion of lending rates post-crisis, particularly since March 2011, compared to the pre-crisis dispersion of non-financial corporate lending. And this is going to affect, of course, the ability of the corporate sector to recover from the financial um, crisis and to invest and grow again. So let's look a little bit at the, the highlights of the, of the weak recovery in the Eurozone so far. The first thing that we can notice here, of course, is this is just a repeat of the chart we saw a few minutes ago, the fact that we're still below the pre-crisis levels in Europe. And even when we're beginning to see some growth now, it is still quite weak by historical standards. Uh, we in the IMF are forecasting 1.5% positive growth for the Eurozone in 2015 and 1.6% in 2016. Um, and those numbers are the best numbers that the Eurozone has seen since the crisis, but they're still quite weak by historical standards. And they're significantly worse than what we're expecting in the US and the UK. Both uh, countries are in the 25 to 3% range over the next couple of years. So we have a recovery that is significantly less robust than we see in the US and the UK. This, of course, is accompanied by high unemployment. Uh, Eurozone unemployment is above 10% on average. 
And when you strip out Germany, whose unemployment rate is only around five, the average for the remaining countries is significantly above that. And you can see that in countries like Italy and, and Spain, uh, unemployment is, is, is quite high and has not has begun to decline in Spain, but has not yet begun to decline in Italy. I didn't even put Greece on here. Greece is, would, would break the chart off the top at about 30% unemployment. Um, another important aspect of the recovery is that this is just the latest in a historical pattern of a widening gap in GDP growth performance from, between Europe and the United States. The historical context is essentially that from the post-World War II period until the early 1990s, Europe essentially grew faster than the U.S. There was a lot of catch-up going on. And since 1990, that trend has begun to reverse itself. And that reversal has become more acute since the financial crisis. And you can see this in the chart, how, how the fan sort of extends out. Um, and remember, this is taking already into account the, the demographic differences between the Eurozone and the U.S. because we're doing this in per capita terms. So there is a significant um, growth gap between the U.S. and the Eurozone. Uh, this is reflective of problems with Eurozone's potential output growth. For those of you who aren't economists, the potential output is sort of the way we calculate what would be a sustainable growth rate for a particular country. And you can grow above your potential for a short period of time, but you can't sustainably grow above your potential. And if you go below your potential because of a recession, we anticipate that you would generally rebound to that level. So what we see here is that potential output growth has, has slipped substantially from still relatively weak pre-crisis levels. So 2006, 2007, Eurozone potential output growth is about 1.4%. From the, from the post-crisis period, we're looking at potential output growth of, uh, of less than one. So that is suggesting that once the cyclical recovery in Europe is completed, which it hasn't yet, those 1.5% growth rates might revert to something more like 1 or even below 1 if this trend of low potential output growth continues. Um, the, um, there, there, there are many stories behind what's going on here, but if you look at the three main components of potential output growth, you see that in each case there has been a weakening. So the green, the green part of the bar is the potential employment growth. Why is this weakening? Largely for demographic reasons. And in some countries, there is a, an anticipation that there's going to be a leveling off of workforce participation rates. So we have a, more aged uh, populations, less people of working age, and then the, the sharp secular increase in female labor force participation in some countries is beginning to level off. So we're getting less from the employment factor of production. The red one is the capital growth, and we're going to talk about that a, a bit more in a few minutes, because capital growth, of course, is largely coming from investment, and there's been a sharp drop in investment in the euro area, which is causing the lessening of the capital contribution to potential output growth. And, and the third factor is factor productivity growth. That's sort of the catch-all that we use to, to indicate how we are getting more output from a given amount of labor and capital. And it's quite striking that total factor productivity's contribution to potential output growth in the immediate pre-crisis and post-crisis period is in fact negative. So we were actually getting a decline in total factor productivity. And, and now we're getting minuscule total factor productivity growth. Now, I should be clear here on this point about total factor productivity. This particular aspect is not unique to the Eurozone. This is something that the UK is also suffering from, actually some negative productivity growth in recent years in the UK. The US is having some positive uh, factor productivity growth, but much weaker than historically. So all sort of advanced economies have a common problem on the total factor productivity front. Is, it, would you, is, it, is this a, something you could, you could define in a common sense way as, as efficiency? I mean, uh, yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's broadly speaking how you get more from the same factors of production. And um, 
you know, there was there was a boost in factor productivity growth in many advanced economies that people have associated with the rise of information technology, and that seems to have uh, run its course, and we seem to be stalling in our factor productivity. Um, <clears throat> so, what are the reasons for the slow recovery in the eurozone compared to? other parts of the world, other advanced economies. And I'm going to point to four of these, and then we're going to focus on the fourth one a little bit. The first one is that monetary policy stimulus came slower and later in the Eurozone than it came in both the US and the UK, and frankly, in Japan as well. So the ECB did act. It did implement quantitative easing, but much later than the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England. And that's one factor there. So when it happened, the, the ECB did uh, implement low policy rates, outright monetary transactions, and moving more recently to quantitative easing, but much slower and much less aggressively after the initial crisis than happened in the US and the UK. The second major factor is that fiscal policy was less helpful. Um, while in the US, the deficit expanded enormously in the immediate crisis period, and consolidation was a bit more um, measured. In the Eurozone, there was neither the as wide an expansion of the deficit nor as gradual a readjustment of that deficit over time. Uh, now, we could say that part of this may have had to do with the slide that I showed a few minutes ago, where we looked at the indebtedness levels, the pre-crisis of some of those countries. But certainly there was something else going on as well. European rules, on a stability and growth pact, for example, requiring deficit reductions that were certainly more aggressive than we in the IMF would have advised and did advise, in fact. Um, so um, the third point is uh, structural impediments to economic growth. And here, you know, we have this sort of catch-all category of structural reforms, which refer to all sorts of things that might hamper either the ability of an economy to grow or the ability of an economy to respond resiliently to crisis. And I think there are some aspects of both in the kinds of rigidities that we have in the, in the Eurozone, labor market, product market, and economic governance problems. I'll, I have one more slide on that. We'll talk just a little bit more. And then, of course, there are financial sector issues that we'll discuss in more detail. So here's a slide to illustrate point one, the monetary policy stance. So what this slide shows is the central bank's balance sheets as a share of GDP and how those have changed over time. So what you'll notice is if you look at the, the green and the blue lines, those represent the US and the UK, they started out with very low central bank balance sheet exposure. And then they ramp up quite significantly and, um, and continue to go up over time. I should have, I should have rebased this slide on a, on, a, on a common 100 so that you could see this more clearly. But to try to illustrate, the US Federal Reserve goes from just over 5% of GDP in balance sheet exposure to, um, to around 20% of GDP in exposure more recently. So it's sort of a four times increase in the exposure of the Federal Reserve, which means that's the quantitative easing effects, the monetary transactions effects. It's the money that the Federal Reserve has been pumping out into the economy. Well, the increment is 15% of GDP. Correct, correct, yeah. correct. In the case of, of the ECB, which is the red line, you see quite a robust increase uh, in the 2011 to 2012 period. And you, did, you do get from about 15% of GDP to, say, 27, 28% of GDP, something like that. So slightly less than 15% of GDP. But then you see a decrease, and a very significant decrease in the ECB from 2012 to 2014. Uh, I think our view in the IMF is that this was a big mistake. Uh, there was a perception, I think, in the ECB that the uh, unconventional monetary policies uh, had been effective, growth had started up again, and they began to withdraw their participation in the markets. And I think this was a contributing factor to that second dip of the double-dip recession. Now, the real outlier here, of course, is the, is the is the Bank of Japan, where you see they started quite high. They increased maybe from 20% of GDP to about 
30% of GDP by 2012. And then you have this takeoff. And this is Abenomics that we're starting to see here, where the Bank of Japan has become much more aggressive in quantitative easing as in an attempt to bring the Japanese economy more definitively out of its decades-long stagnation. So um, I guess, you know, as, a, as an economist looking at the ECB's performance here, I would say that there were three points of time when the ECB could have done more and, and failed to do so. The first one was in 2007 when the ECB still hiked rates, literally just a couple of months before the Fed began to radically reduce them. Uh, they seem to be very late in catching on to the magnitude of the world financial crisis. The second area was that the ECB began to withdraw from its extraordinary monetary measures and actually raised interest rates by a, by a token amount in around the 2011-2012 period and kind of had to retract that action and, and go back to zero interest rate policies and, and an aggressive quantitative easing. And, and we in the IMF are strongly supportive of the quantitative easing policies of uh, ECB President Draghi. And we are um, quite pleased when we hear the kinds of uh, news that has come out of the ECB governing board uh, last week, uh, arguing that they will do whatever for however long it takes. So there may be in the cards the possibility of either an expansion of the monthly quantitative easing or an extension of the time frame for quantitative easing or both. And in our view, that's, that's an appropriate response because as you can see, the, the line does start to tick up in 2014. I guess that in the last one should be 2015, but it's not ticking up by that much yet. So there's still scope for additional quantitative easing to stimulate economic growth. So this just repeats what I had, had said earlier, this sort of using the low policy rates plus outright monetary transactions plus quantitative easing. So on the fiscal stance, we can see a similar sort of weaker response from the Eurozone than what we see from the US uh, and, and in fact the UK as well. Um, we see that the starting point for the Euro area was in fact in terms of deficit, a better fiscal position than, than either the US or the UK, where the aggregate fiscal deficit in 2007 for the euro area was, was under 1% of GDP. But what we can also see is that the increment from the, the 2007 rate to the sort of peak time you would want to be stimulating your economy with a fiscal deficit is only going from about you know, a little less than 1% of the GDP to a little less than 6% of GDP. So about a 5 percentage point shift. In the U.S., we see a much more dramatic change. We're going from about 2% of GDP in 2006 down to over 12% of GDP in 2009. So the sort of implicit fiscal uh, stimulus, or perhaps what I should say is the, the lack of negative fiscal stimulus, was much more noticeable in the case of the US. Japan and the UK are, are sort of intermediate cases, but there again, you see a much greater use of fiscal policy to try to cushion the blow of the, of the recovery. Um, so so um, there again, I think that the, the, the Eurozone was in a position where they were less aggressively using the fiscal policy tool and that produced less uh, favorable outcomes. So what's happened more recently and what we you know, would strongly support is the fact that because there was so much fiscal adjustment in Europe over the last five years, we're now in a position where in the aggregate the Eurozone has a roughly neutral fiscal policy for 2015. So it's been negative. There's been a fiscal drag on the economy since 2011 as countries consolidate their budget deficits. Now we're in a position where we have a roughly neutral policy in the aggregate. Some are slightly stimulative, some are slightly restrictive, but on aggregate it's roughly neutral. And you're taking away that drag of the fiscal on the economy and that helps boost your growth up to this one and a half, 1.6% that we see this year and next year. Um, there has been a change in the thinking in the Eurozone on fiscal deficits and an attempt to revise the fiscal targets to take into consideration more the need to stimulate the economy when you're in an economic downturn. So the Stability and Growth Pact is moving more towards measuring uh, compliance in terms of structural deficits rather than in terms of uh, headline deficits. 
so that when the, when the economic uh, cyclical component of the deficit goes down, you're not asking economies to also withdraw fiscal stimulus at the same time. There's a final point here, which is that the, under the Stability and Growth Pact now, there is some flexibility that didn't exist before to allow countries to be rewarded, as it were, for uh, attempting to, to undertake structural reforms that could give them better resilience and growth over the medium and long term. This is still quite controversial, of course, because it's very hard to quantify the effects of structural reforms. And so, you know, some countries who are on the more conservative end of things uh, see this as a possible loophole for countries that want to cheat on the deficit targets. And the countries... Um, that, uh, that want to undertake uh, structural reforms and don't want to have that negative fiscal impulse, of course, are trying to take advantage of that. Um, so I'll just briefly mention some of the issues on the structural reform efforts that have been undertaken by the Eurozone uh, in the sort of third of those four points that I outlined for you a few minutes ago. The first, of course, and perhaps the most important, is that there have been very significant national structural reform efforts in certain countries. Sometimes these have come under the auspices of IMF slash EU adjustment programs. But in other cases, they have been from countries sort of making the decision on their own that they really needed to do some severe structural reforms. And the clearest, most recent example of this is Italy, where they don't have, and they haven't had, an IMF or EU program, but they have been uh, quite aggressive under Renzi in moving the structural reform process forward. Spain is a bit of more of a mixed case because they never had an IMF program and they had an EU partial program which was just financially sector related, but the Spanish government alongside of that did undertake some significant reforms. There's, there's a country that's not on that list, Greece, and we can talk about that in the question and answer period if you want. Um, this, the second area of reform efforts have been some improvements in European governance. Uh, so there has been a real attempt, a recognition by the Eurozone, that the mechanisms for governing things like the deficit, evaluating structural reforms, um, evaluating uh, uh, competitiveness, have not been adequate. And so there have been attempts both sort of on the on the talky side, which is the European semester, where they review each country's overall economic picture every six months and try to sort of give advice and discuss with the countries what they're doing well and could do better. And also the, uh, the changes in the way the Stability and Growth Pact is structured and are governed. And, and I can go into that more in the question period if you're interested in that. The third area is there, ha there are renewed efforts to complete the single market. I mean, what's quite striking as someone who, who parachutes in here from uh, having been off of Europe for a few years is how much uh, single market infrastructure still needs to be completed. So there has been a huge step forward over the last few years in banking union, but the banking union is far from complete. There are also things like digital markets initiative. I was shocked when I moved to Brussels a few months ago and found how difficult it is to buy something online from Germany. Um, it's actually quite difficult. Um, and, and yet, you know, you can order something from Amazon in the US almost more easily. It just costs, the shipping costs kill you. Um, so so there, is, there are some efforts to try to push the the market integration aspect of this further. And I think the most recent one, of course, has been the Capital Markets Union Initiative, which has just been launched. And the final one and, and the five, is the Five Presidents Report, which was recently re released. It does contain some of the governance reforms and the single market reforms, but also contains other things like competitiveness councils as a way of trying to get uh, European governments to think more comprehensively about their structural barriers to, to competition. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit now about the financial sector side of things. Um, this chart goes beyond the government chart I showed at the beginning of the presentation and looks at the change in indebtedness in the euro area for governments, non-financial corporates, and households. What is quite interesting here it's not particularly surprising that indebtedness in the euro area has gone up 
between 2008 and 2014. First, of course, we're measuring this as a share of GDP, and GDP, we saw earlier, is actually below its pre-crisis level. So that's not particularly a surprising aspect of it. It's also not particularly surprising that government component of this has gone up, because this is, of course, just the inevitable result of large fiscal deficits. What is rather surprising <coughs> is the extent to which there has not been a lot of deleveraging in the corporate or the um, household sectors. And I should have brought the chart for the US on this, where you can see that in the crisis period, households in the US deleveraged quite aggressively. And now the level of household indebtedness in the US is significantly lower. And what that means is that consumers, if they want to, now have some space to re-indebt themselves. Likewise, on the corporate sector, there was a significant reduction in the US. Now there's an expansion going on. And you haven't seen the reduction in Europe, so you, you don't have space for the, the, the additional borrowing at this time. Um, Low inflation also contributes to these high debt to GDP ratios, of course, because if you have very little real growth and you have negative inflation, your GDP in nominal terms could actually be shrinking. And with no additional indebtedness, your debt to GDP ratio could still be going up. But here's the chart I want to spend a little time talking about. This, in my mind, tells a lot of the story of the financial sector component of the European uh, slow recovery. So on the, on the left-hand side, we have the United States. And what we have on the bars on the bottom are net non-performing loans. So what you can see is A, those numbers never got very big, and B, they got small relatively quickly. Jumping up to the gold-colored or yellow-colored dots, what you can see is one of the reasons why NPLs never got that large in the US is because US banks are extremely aggressive at writing off loans. They just take the loss and they move on. And, and, and that clears the decks for future lending. Um, they also have quite high provisioning ratios. So the banks are setting aside the money, they're writing off the loans using the provisions, and then they're ready to move ahead. They've cleared their, their books of these bad loans. When you look at the Eurozone, you see a very different story. You see a story of high and rising non-performing loans. And, and, the, and the, you know, the sad thing about this is, this is rising not during the crisis, but in the post-crisis period, non, net non-performing loans are still rising. You see much lower write-off ratios. So these are the same, the opposite sides of the same coin. If you're not writing them off, they're staying on your books and your NPL ratio is going to be quite high. Uh, your provisioning is actually less than in the US. So the banks have not set aside the cash to facilitate that kind of write-off in the future. So you have you have a, a, a situation where, as we say at the bottom here, your banking system becomes clogged with non-performing loans and it's not able to move into lending for new investment uh, as you pull out of the crisis. Um, I won't say much about Japan, except you can see the time scale on Japan is different. We're looking back at the period uh, in the early 2000s in Japan, and that Japan looks much more like Europe than it looks like the US. And of course, we know that Japan had a serious problem with clogged banking systems, zombie banks, we used to call them, uh, in, in Japan, where they weren't able to lend much because they were clogged. Yeah. Where the, the, the non-performing loan in your area in 2010, were they historic, or did they, did they, did they arise in the context of the crisis? Um, they actually weren't that much higher than the U.S. before the crisis. So, okay. so if, if it, it did rise during the crisis. A very good question. Excellent question. Now, those ch the chart I had on the previous page hides a lot of heterogeneity within Europe. And this is the s slide that illustrates the heterogeneity within Europe. So we've, we've arranged all the countries in order from highest to lowest non-performing loans ratio. Uh, not particularly surprising that Cyprus, Greece, and Ireland are at the top of that list because those were countries that had extremely severe financial crises. Um, but what is 
you know, what is interesting is Ireland was very, very low. I mean, this is this answers partly your question here. That the blue dots are showing what the pre-crisis levels were. Okay. Maybe a bit higher than the U.S., but still quite low uh, compared to after. And of course, with Ireland in the financial crisis, there was this huge jump. Um, in a place like Italy, the problem has been more chronic. But even there, you see that the number has jumped from, say, 7% up above 15%. And uh, when we get to the other extreme, we see countries where this is really not such a big issue. And these essentially are uh, sort of the more Germanic uh, countries in Finland uh, uh, in there as well. Estonia, Finland, uh, Netherlands, Austria, Germany, and Luxembourg at the low end. This little insert here is just kind of interesting uh, to just see the difference between northern Italy and southern Italy. So what you essentially have economically, and I, I'm not the first to have, have, have noted this fact, is essentially two countries. You have a, a northern Italy that looks a lot like Germany. You have a southern Italy that looks a lot more like Greece. And, and this, this illustrates the, the issue. <clears throat> so with clogged banking system, what do we see? We see weak credit growth. So... Uh, <clears throat> If you look at the, at the right-hand side, what's happening in the U.S., you see that credit growth was above 10% pre-crisis, drops to negative, say, 7.5%, and then recovers fairly robustly to around uh, uh, 10%, uh, well, between 5 and 10% in 2014. So a huge drop, as we would expect, huge banking crisis, but actually quite a, quite a robust recovery. Look at on the other side and what you see in Europe, actually higher credit growth pre-crisis. A big drop, and then you see a double dip in credit as well. And the credit numbers uh, just barely clear the zero threshold in 2011 and then drop back down into negative territory. So we still have negative credit growth in 2014 in the Eurozone. So it's not particularly surprising that we're getting this low contribution of capital to potential output growth, and we're seeing low overall economic growth. Now, we've also put the NPLs here so that you could sort of see the comparison. Once again, you see the peak in the U.S. followed by a sharp decline in non-performing loans. And then you actually see a steady rise in Europe. And this is, you know, what's quite striking is even as the recovery is sort of trying to get underway, that's not actually bringing NPLs down. They're continuing to accumulate. So, less credit, less investment. This chart shows, I think this is one of the most striking charts I use when I talk about uh, what's, what's wrong with Europe. The investment level in real terms, if 2008 is 100, is 85 around in, in the Eurozone in 2014. It's 15 percentage points below what it was before. And look what's happened to the US, the UK, and even Japan. U.S. is well above its, pre, uh, its pre-crisis investment levels at about 105. Uh, U.K. near, right around the same level, slightly higher even. And, and Japan is dipped back down below its pre-crisis levels, but from a very sharp drop, the, the Japan's investment is essentially back to where it was before. But in the Eurozone, we haven't seen that recovery of investment. If you're going to have these very, very low levels of investment, you're not going to get the kind of economic growth on a sustained uh, basis. So what's missing in Europe, in the financial sector, to try to bring uh, things back to a, a higher growth equilibrium? Um, this is more of a monetary policy issue, but it has financial sector Im implications. There is a, a need to pursue the quantitative easing policies in order to get inflation back to positive levels on a sustainable basis. Um, actual inflation, you'll notice here for the Eurozone, went into negative territory, pulled out of negative territory, and then dipped back in. And you have more than half the countries in the Eurozone with negative 12-month inflation today. And that's not going to be an environment in which financial sector operations are going to be able to work as efficiently as if you have uh, a positive inflation scenario. Um, so this is a little bit more about the asset-backed uh, purchases that the ECB has been undertaking and some early effects 
of the uh, quantitative easing policy on the exchange rates. The exchange rates have been bumping around a, a bit, and you see that the, the US dollar euro has, has actually jumped in the last couple of months after dropping quite significantly because of, I think mainly because of problems in third, in third countries, Chinese concerns about China, et cetera. Um, but clearly, from the slides that I've given you earlier, there has to be an, an approach to solving non-performing loans in a way that clears out the clog in the banking system and gets lending going again. So we've made some recommendations to our colleagues in the ECB and to national authorities. You could do things like essentially tax long-term NPLs. Give banks a financial incentive to get them off their books. So if you, if you as a regulator, a, a banking regulator, to say, if you keep these NPLs on your books longer than 18 months or two years or whatever it is, you're going to have to put excess provisions against those loans. Banks might start finding a way to write those off more quickly. The second thing that has to happen, you could say, well, why don't the banks just do this on their own? Why don't they act like American banks? And one of the reasons is because insolvency and foreclosure systems in some Eurozone countries are not well adapted to this. In some countries, you can foreclose on a mortgage in less than six months. In other cases, it takes more than six years. Uh, more, most recently, uh, just the day before yesterday, I think, Mr. Tsipras was saying that uh, uh, in Greece, which it takes uh, about a decade to foreclose, over his dead body, were they going to make that quicker? Um, we'll, we'll see what happens there. Um, but, but clearly, insolvency and foreclosure systems have to allow for cleaning out the clogs in the banking system. And then the third aspect, which could be a win-win solution, is to jumpstart a market for distressed debt. So if you are a, a less than stellar borrower in the United States and you miss a couple of payments on your credit card, uh, after about three months, you will get, you'll get letters from the very beginning. But after about three months, those letters are going to be coming not from the credit card, company or from the store where you borrowed the money, they'll be coming from a specialized debt management agency. So what has happened is that that bank has sold that loan at a discount to a debt management company that specializes in getting money out and collecting from people. That doesn't happen in most European countries. And banks are actually not that good at collecting on bad debts. They're not specialized in that. So if you can jumpstart a market for distressed debt, you can give banks an outlet to get rid of those loans. And in some cases, if they're fully provisioned, the banks would be happy to get rid of them for, you know, 10 cents on the euro if they could at least get them off their books because 10 cents is better than zero and they've already provisioned 100%. So, but in many countries, those mechanisms don't exist. And there are ways in which regulators can facilitate that by, for example, helping with common rules for securitization of distressed debt. So you take all your bad loans, you lump them together, you sell them off as a package. And that can help give the incentive for these debt collection agencies to form. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so this is a slide uh, which which um, reports on some research that we did uh, uh, six or eight months ago on uh, a, um, a what-if scenario. And the what-if scenario is, what if we were uh, able to get a 5% percentage point reduction in non-performing loans in different countries on average, from however we would do that? What would that do to the capital of the banks in the different uh, countries? And what you can see here is that um, it could be quite significant in the contribution to recovery of the banks in certain countries, Ireland, Italy, Portugal, Spain. Less so in those countries where you have already relatively low uh, non-performing loans. Um, and then the, 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 the error bars around this are bank to bank. This was micro data. So in some banks, it could be extremely important, and in other banks, not so important. Um, building a capital markets union could also help 
uh, reactivate investment in Europe. One of the key facts of investment in Europe versus investment in the United States is that corporate investment in Europe is much more dependent on banks and much less dependent on capital markets and less dependent on equity than in the US. So what we're saying is not only have the banks been clogged up in Europe, but European corporations are much more dependent on banks than in the US. So in the US, if your bank can't lend you, loan you money, if you've got a reasonable uh, corporate operation, you can usually go out and issue a bond. And if necessary, you can even securitize. So the, the fame, one of the famous stories of the pre-crisis period was the, the quite foresighted CEO of Ford Motor who went out and borrowed everything against everything he could. He mortgaged the headquarters buildings, he mortgaged the factories. Uh, I don't know how he knew it was coming, but that made Ford the only uh, of the big three U.S. automakers that did not go into bankruptcy in the crisis because they were able to securitize and borrow significantly without ever going to the banks. They also went to the banks. I, sh I shouldn't say that. But they, but they also went to the capital markets in a way that European corporates just don't, <clears throat> don't or can't do. <clears throat> so how do, we, how do we make it easier for European corporates to access securities markets as opposed to just relying heavily on banks? Well, uh, Lord Hill has recently launched, as part of his capital markets union, some proposals in this area. One of the proposals is that you have common standards so that you can have cross-border securitization. So if I'm in a UK investor and I buy a corporate bond in Spain and I buy another corporate bond in Germany, I know that I'm getting roughly the same product, which we don't know now because they aren't standardized. And what that means is that you don't have a common market for securitization. And one of the, one of the key points of the recent crisis has been that the countries that have the money and the countries that need the money are not the same countries, usually. And so that is a huge barrier for <clears throat> access. Um, so you can, you can facilitate by standardizing securitization instruments, have common standards, and, re and remove national differences in the treatment of uh, securitized financing and equity financing versus bank borrowing financing. <clears throat> so this is a picture of what the European securitization market looks like. And not only was it smaller than the US in 2007, it's essentially collapsed. And that's, that's another illustration of the need to... Uh, to, to take some action in that area. <clears throat> um, another component would be to complete the banking union. There has been, I, I think if you would have asked me before the crisis, would Europe be able to move aggressively towards a banking union in the, uh, in the, in the wake of the crisis, I would have said no, because Europe never does anything quickly. But actually, they moved quite quickly in banking union, but they're not quite completed yet. And so there's some significant areas that still need to be finished. One is that bank, there's common banking resolution framework for the largest banks. But the single resolution fund has a pitiful amount of resources. And if we actually get, got into another banking crisis now, it would be completely overwhelmed very, very quickly. The second, <clears throat> um, you know, the second issue is direct recapitalization. So one of the correct, I think, conclusions that people had in the financial crisis was these bankers are causing us such a huge problem for the world. And then what, what do we do? We turn around and bail them out. So we've got to find a way to make them pay. And there is a banking directive that the EU prepared, which requires bank bail-ins whenever public support is being provided. The problem is that they've made it so strict that um, the temptation is actually not to bail out the banks, to leave zombie banks, because if you, if you try to bail them out, then you have to bail in all the big depositors, but the big depositors are your big corporates, and you don't want to take the money from your big corporates. So you have this sort of tension there, and, and I think uh, some more 
a more relaxed approach to bail-in might work better here. And the final point is, is a common European deposit guarantee scheme. If any of you follow the discussions about this, you know that certain countries have significant resistance to this at this time. But ultimately, if you're going to have a common banking system, you've got to have common resolution and common deposit guarantee, uh, or it's not going to function. So I'll stop there. Um, I think what, what we would conclude as, the, as an international monetary fund is that after making a few stumbles along the way to the correct policies for recovery, uh, the Eurozone is now in a much better position and is doing most of what it needs to do. It's doing the monetary policy it probably should have done three years ago. It's relaxed the fiscal consolidation and allowed countries more flexibility in their fiscal deficits. It's pushing for, um, it's pushing for additional structural reforms and some countries are, are moving quite aggressively on that front. But there still is an only partially completed component, which is the financial sector uh, reforms and recovery. Thank you. Thanks.